Hi, this is Brad Anderson. I'm a state specialist with Missouri's 4-H Center for Youth Development. Uh, this is a recorded version of an ISE, an in-service training opportunity that was offered for Missouri 4-H professional audiences on the topic of youth leadership on December 1st, 2015. It is geared towards Missouri 4-H professional audiences, but it may be useful for other youth serving audiences as well if they have an interest in our topic. And our topic today is youth leadership research. Uh, leadership is something that we all know a lot about. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about where I'm coming from with this. I started my career in Extension in Crawford County uh, back in 97. I got a chance to work with the 4-H Army Youth Development Project, first as a specialist and later on as the Youth Development Coordinator. And in that role, I kind of got to go around to different uh, in Army installations and train youth-serving staff on principles of youth development the way we do things in 4-H. After that, I came back and I worked at the 4-H Center here as a state specialist since 2007. And leadership has just been something that's been near and dear to my heart the whole time. Um, I'm finishing up the next degree right now in educational leadership. And in my career uh, with the Army Team Panel, I got a chance to work with them. Uh, it's kind of like the State 4-H Council, but with 16 different time zones. I got a chance to work with the go back to my region and start an Army Regional Team Panel, and it was pretty successful, and they ended up requiring that for every region, uh, Army-wide, and then I got a chance to come back and work on the State 4-H Council here in Missouri and coordinate that, and so that really brought me back to Missouri uh, because of the great potential we have and the way we do things here in Missouri 4-H. And of course, when I started, uh, I got some great role models and some great uh, opportunities because our County 4-H Councils were led by youth so I guess if I had to pick a theme for my career, it would be engaging the voice of youth. And I know that's probably something a lot of you share as well. Where we're going with this uh, ISE or virtual ISE is first, I'm hoping that we can help give some information that structures our existing leadership knowledge. As I said, it's something we all know something about. We've all been uh, experienced with leadership. We've been teaching and developing leadership. Uh, we are also able to grow our understandings whenever we can uh, give our thoughts and our insights some structure. And so that's one of the things we're hoping to accomplish here. As we go along with that, uh, inevitably we'll hopefully deconstruct some of the misconceptions that we all have about leadership because we've all been taught through the years uh, many different things about what a leader is. And the confusing thing is that there's a little bit of truth to each of the different perspectives even when they conflict with each other. Arnold Schwarzenegger, for example, in Commando, excellent leader. Just watch the movie, it's fantastic. But uh, that's not necessarily the, the uh, only uh, leadership style that works or the one that's always the most appropriate. So as we frame leadership research, um, this will give us some tools to put some of the uh, leadership research that we come across and we read into some kind of context. Uh, help us organize what we're reading in ways that make sense and jive with the rest of our understandings and experience. And then finally, I hope that by the end of this ISE, we'll be able to kind of see where what we're doing fits into the bigger picture, orienting our leadership strategies and our efforts into the larger study of leadership development. There's an often cited study uh, that talked about the need for leadership, and I really like this because it says the successful performance of a team depends on member effort, member ability, organization of the task, teamwork and cooperation, availability of resources, and external coordination. And the reason I like that so much is because it really speaks to the need for a leader. You need somebody who's going to get the best efforts from everyone. You need someone who's going to recognize the abilities of others and help develop them. And somebody that keeps everybody on task and organized. And you need a leader who uh, you know, facilitates teamwork and cooperation. And especially in our organization, helps find resources. And there's the coordination piece. So it really speaks to a need for leadership and many, many different tasks and experiences. So let's look at some of the literature out there. And by the literature, we're talking about the research. Um, just in terms of things that lend themselves to leadership, there's been a few studies that show that uh, the strongest impacts that 4-H has made, stronger than those of other organizations uh, as people look back on their young lives, one of the strongest impacts 4-H has made is with public speaking skills. And that's no surprise, right? 
Community volunteerism was another one. Civic engagement, civic identity, and viewing yourself as somebody who's active and involved and gives back. And then self-discipline, making the hard choices, doing the right thing, self-responsibility as well. And of course, teamwork. Whenever there's a 4-H question, teamwork's always going to be one of the answers, even if that's not what's being asked. So th this is really not too surprising, but these are things that lend themselves to leadership, and it's things that we're all probably pretty involved in. However, if we were to look at some of the research on leadership-specific skills, uh, again, we're looking at 4-H versus other youth-serving organizations. And Bruce Boyd and Dooley, back in 2004, had a really good study that uh, showed alumni credited their experience in 4-H as key to their development of communication, decision-making, understanding of how groups function, and understanding of themselves. And again, it's, there's some similarities there, but uh, you can see how that might be the case. So as we look at this ISE and look where we're going, uh, we're going to talk about approaches to leadership. There's a couple of uh, key approaches. Uh, the trade approach, which focuses on the qualities that we're born with. And then there's a skills approach, which focuses on the things we can learn along the way. After that, we'll look at some leadership theory. And we'll explore ways of looking at leadership or ways of understanding leadership uh, and uh, go from there. So let's get going. The trade approach is our first way of understanding leadership, or our first approach to the study of leadership, rather. And this is the paradigm or the perspective that leaders are born, they're not made. You're either a leader or you're not. And this is an early approach that uh, occurred and developed somewhere around the late 1940s. And you'll find that I'm reading these slides a lot because I don't really know how good a resolution you have on your screen. So forgive me for reading to you, uh, but hopefully if you're a visual person or an audio person or both, uh, one way or the other will uh, be able to be helpful here. So you have to think about what was happening in the 1940s. Uh, the World War had wrapped up. There's a lot of chaos in the world. So, it, or at least there had been. It makes sense that people were really focused on identifying the qualities and the characteristics of great leaders, knowing who to follow, where they are, identifying those people. Um, I think our experience might say that whether one is born with leadership skills or whether one acquires them, uh, research does suggest that there are certain traits that are critically important to the ability to lead effectively. Again, this is something we probably all know. Um, so we kind of move on here. But first, let's talk about who's a leader. Those most likely, according to research, to be perceived as a leader have these following characteristics. They tend to be more physically gifted. They tend to be more frequent communicators. Uh, they tend to be external processors, you know, those people who think out loud, extroverted. Um, I have to say this kind of irks me because there's probably good reasons for this. But, you know, if you're an introvert or you're somebody who likes to think before you speak, the research suggests that you may be less likely to be perceived as a leader than the person who's just thinking out loud as they go. Males, five times more likely to be perceived as a leader. People who are better task performers also, especially if there's a particular task at hand, of course. Basically, Captain Kirk is uh, who we're likely to be perceived as a leader. And at least that's who I thought of. It kind of dates me here. But the interesting thing is that most of these things, with the exception of Captain Kirk, are not related to actual leadership effectiveness. Males are no better leaders than females. Uh, people who are... Well, those who think out loud may not be a better leader than somebody who thinks before they speak. Uh, people who are more physically gifted may not be the best people to lead in any given situation. So perceptions and reality, again, are pretty different sometimes. So we talk about the skills approach. This is different than the first approach we talked about. This is the idea that leaders can be made and leaders can be improved, whether you're a natural leader coming out of the womb or not. This focuses on the skills and abilities that can be learned or developed with time and experience. Now this uh, view or this uh, effort began in the mid 1950s and interest in the approach started reemerging in the 1990s. Again, happier times, you know, the 1950s, a lot happier than the 1940s. And the 90s were pretty great as well. Uh, but there's an emphasis on abilities to solve problems 
in complex organizations, complex organizational problems specifically. Now, a lot of this uh, research is generated from the business community, but the idea was that there are certain characteristics, competencies, and attributes that are just central to good leadership, and that's the skills approach, and we'll be talking a little bit more about that. If you want to be a better leader, and this is in contrast to the first set of slides we were saying if you wish to be seen as a leader, but actual characteristics that will help you be a better leader, uh, research suggests that the, one of the first ones is intelligence. And this is shown through things like communication skills, your reasoning ability, your perceptiveness. And caveat here, it can be counterproductive if your intelligence seems to be too different from your followers. And our poster child for this is Mr. Sheldon Cooper, Bazinga. He, if, if you watch The Big Bang Theory, he is a very bright, brilliant person, but he's the first person to tell you about it. And if you don't know it, just ask him. He will tell you he's way smarter than you. And it gets to the point where nobody really cares. So if you are viewed as being too different from your followers and your intelligence, uh, it could backfire. Of course, if you don't want to be a leader, that could be a good thing, right? When we talk about intelligence, and for a long time they've studied uh, intelligence in terms of fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence. And fluid intelligence is that hardwired capability, that thing that you're born with. You come out of the, the womb and you just, some people are faster, they're small, their brain works faster, they're quicker on their feet, uh, maybe they have better abstract skills, their response speed is faster, they recognize patterns. This is all dependent on the central nervous system, and because of that, it tends to decrease with age, and it varies from individual to individual. On the other hand, there's crystallized intelligence, uh, and that are the, we're talking about the skills and the knowledge that you learn from living. Those of us who don't have a lot of the first kind of rely on the second one. Uh, evaluating your experience, your reasoning through life problems, uh, developing life skills, and so on. Uh, these are things that contribute to crystallized intelligence, and this is something that actually increases with age. So you might be uh, on the upward trajectory as you go through the lifespan, but when you start getting to young adulthood and middle age, you start to uh, lose some of your uh, speed in your central nervous system. And, uh, however, while your fluid intelligence may go down, your crystallized intelligence continues to increase through the course of your lifespan as long as you're applying yourself and trying to learn new things and processing your knowledge and reflecting on what you've learned. So, moving on, characteristics to cultivate if you wish to be a better leader. Another one is self-confidence. And my, mo my poster child for this one is not Sheldon Cooper. This is actually... Um, well, let's zip here. This is my dog, Dakota. He's my wingman. And self-confidence, we all know, is that belief that you can make a difference and a sense of certain to be your certainty about your own skills and abilities. And this guy, you know, I walk, wake up in the morning. He says, hey, it's been a long night. I need to go hit the front yard. And I say, okay. And we, we go out the front yard and I open the door and the, he steps right out and something changes. He steps onto that front step and all of a sudden he's looking for what needs to be done. He's looking at his kingdom. What does my kingdom need? Protect, preserve, intimidate, uh, pursue. And I'm saying the kingdom just needs you to peace. I get out there and do your job. So he has to go through that whole process, and then he comes back in, and we're good to go. Um, there's a lot of people who have that sense that you can make a difference and a sense of certainty about their own abilities. But this is something also that may not be innate. That may not be something you're born with. Often it's something that you develop over time uh, through the course of your life and you grow in your self-confidence as you grow in your abilities and your understanding of others. So characteristics to cultivate. Another one is determination. And I love this one because the fact is people have the desire to get the job done. The people who have initiative and persistence and perseverance, those are the people that change the world. It's not the people necessarily with the greatest visions. It's not necessarily the people who are the brightest. It's not necessarily the people who are the most creative. The people that change the world are often the people who show up. And to show up, you have to have persistence, you have to persevere, and you have to overcome obstacles and challenges and keep going. So determination makes sense as a, a very strong uh, component of good leadership. Leaders also have integrity. And this tends to be an all-or-nothing sort of thing. Doing what you say you'll do, being sincere, honest, and trustworthy, loyal and dependable. We all know what integrity is, but the thing is, you cannot be viewed as deceptive. 
because once you're viewed as deceptive, you lose your integrity card and it can be almost impossible to get it back. Finally, a characteristics to cultivate if you want to be a better leader. Research suggests sociability. People who are friendly, outgoing, courteous, tactful, diplomatic, uh, they cooperate, they work well with others, they're concerned, genuinely concerned about the needs and the well-being of the people they're leading, uh, tend to make better leaders. People want to follow them. People know that they care. And people know that they're in good hands. So let's talk about personality traits. Extroversion. Earlier I was riffing on uh, external communicators and how irked I was that they're viewed as better leaders. But you know, when someone's talking a lot, you can tell pretty quickly if they're intelligent and have some of these other leadership characteristics, if they truly care about you, if they're a person of character, and so on. So it makes sense that extroverts are um, endowed with qualities that help them lend themselves to leadership. Again, positive energy, I think, is the key there. Number two is conscientiousness, people who are controlled and dependable. Openness, people who are informed, creative, insightful, curious. And we've all probably, anybody who's ever had a dating life knows about low neuroticism. We've probably all dated somebody who maybe was depressed or anxious or insecure. Uh, and those people don't tend to be viewed as effective leaders. So if you're viewing this with a group, this might be a good time just to pause this uh, video and ask what are some of the things we do in our jobs that help to nurture these leadership characteristics? I'm going to pause so you can have a chance to pause and then I'll continue on with the next slides. That was a great discussion. Okay, we're talking about leadership skills. We, it's important to understand that skills needed for leadership sometimes change over time and with career advancement. And there's something that I came across I think is really, really useful uh, called the three skill approach. This is a model that's been around for quite a while. Um, but it talks about technical skill and it talks about human skill, which is your people skills. And it talks about conceptual skill, which is kind of being a big picture person, being a, able to create a vision, uh, strategically plan and so on. And the reason this is important is because these things do, as I mentioned, change over time. Early in your career, especially in corporate America, you might need a high level of technical skill, a high level of human skill. You're really not looked to for the conceptual skills. So that's not really quite as important. However, as you go into the middle management section of your career, uh, you, the human skill remains strong and your need for conceptual skill increases just as your need for technical skill, skill kind of goes down. Because you've got people at the lower levels who can handle those tech things, you need to be able to see how it fits. And finally, at top management levels, again, the technical skill tends to be much lower as far as the skills needed. The conceptual skill tends to be very, very important. And the human skill remains important throughout. So as we're talking about social relationships and teaching uh, youth to work well with others, uh, this is very important to realize that this will continue through the trajectory of their lifespan in their careers. I have a friend who's a CEO of a local uh, health industry headquarters group, and he's saying in an interview, basically, I don't need to be able to write a software program. I just need to understand conceptually what it can do and how you can facilitate processes and communication with the right tools. So we've talked about skills. Let's talk about competencies. Competencies of effective leaders include problem solving, social judgment, they need to be aware of other people's point of view, they need to be able to think beyond their own uh, interests and needs, tuned in to other people and have good communication skills. In addition to problem solving and social judgment, they need to have an accumulation of knowledge. They need to be able to have knowledge of the information uh, needed, especially for any task at hand, but they also need to know the organization. We are increasingly becoming a data-driven organization and a data-driven society. So those people at the center of the data, those people who understand where things are and how to find them, uh, those are the people that are gonna go far. And you know, in extension, that's kind of our job. So it makes sense that this is a leadership competency. Finally, leadership attributes. 
individual attributes of effective leaders include people who are motivated. They're willing to tackle complex problems and exert influence. They're willing to work for the good of people and for the good of the organization. And they have a personality that projects curiosity and confidence and openness to others and tolerance for ambiguity. Ambiguity is a, a fact of life in any organization and it can be something that weeds, the, weeds people out. So we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. So three approaches to leadership. We've talked about the trade approach, uh, things you're born with. We've talked about the skills approach, which are the learned abilities. And now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, leadership theory. Now, the thing I want to emphasize here is that there are various leadership theories, and not all of them are separate and distinct from each other. As you look through the literature out there, uh, some of these theories bleed over into others. They were developed at different times, and some were influenced by others, and there are often similarities between them. So if you see some kind of mirroring others at times, uh, don't be too worried about it. That's to be expected. A lot of this comes from uh, the business world, and we're looking at research on leadership. At least it originated there. And so terms like employee and subordinate are used. Uh, that's not really the terms we would use in 4-H or cooperative extension, but uh, anybody who's uh, in a relationship probably knows that referring to your partner as a subordinate or a teenager as a subordinate generally just doesn't go well. So uh, keep that in mind as we go through this, where this came from, and how it developed. First one is path goal leadership theory. And this is motivate your people and knock down barriers, basically. Path goal leadership theory emphasizes the relationship between a leader's style and the characteristics of the people that they're leading and the characteristics of the situation that they're in. This began in the early 1970s, so again, a totally different time from the two approaches we talked about earlier. And the goal here in the development of this theory was to focus on motivation to enhance employee performance enhance their satisfaction, and if they're satisfied and they're doing well and you're meeting their needs, that gets back to motivation, it gets back to performance, and it was very, very popular and continues to be used to this day. Now, path goal theory talks about four styles of leadership. First is directive, and we've all probably known some of these people in these different styles. Directive leaders give clear instructions, set clear expectations, they tell you how the task is to be done, and they tell you when it was to be done. Second leadership style, supportive leadership. These are leaders who are friendly and approachable. They attend to the well-being and human needs of others. And they treat subordinates as equals. Everybody feels valued in a supportive leadership team. A third style of leadership, participative style. Participative leaders tend to invite subordinates to share in the decision making. They consult with subordinates, they gather their ideas and opinions. And before we go on, I, the picture on the right is an early State 4-H Council meeting from a few years ago. That is definitely a uh, participative leadership type of environment where the people who come there typically are leaders in their own communities and their own clubs and uh, programs, and they come together uh, there's officers in charge, but everybody's expected to share in the decision making, share their ideas and opinions. And they do. Finally, the fourth style, achievement oriented leadership. These are people who set very high expectations, very high standards. They're demanding, they see continuous improvement. But they also show a lot of confidence in their team. They may demand the best out of you, but they'll be the first person to brag about you to somebody else. So let's talk just for a moment, if, especially if you're here with a group. Um, pause the video for a second. We want to ask two questions. One, when would you use each style? And two, does the situation make a difference? If it's a situation with a lot of ambiguity or a little or a lot of risk or just a little bit of risk, does that make a difference in how you would use uh, one of these leadership styles in a given situation? So we'll pause for a minute and give you a chance to discuss that. Unpause when you're ready and we'll proceed. Excellent. Now, path goal theory 
whenever you have a leader, you need to understand there's going to be followers, of course. And the question becomes, how is the leader's style going to be interpreted? Well, as we all know, the answer depends on the situation. And it also depends on what they call subordinate characteristics. If your followers have a strong need for affiliation, then that supportive leadership style may be a really good fit. If they're more authoritarian, dogmatic, very cut and dry, uh, then they might need more of a directive leadership style. They might prefer that. They might, not, they might view supportive leadership as being wishy-washy, direct leadership as being clear. If they have an internal locus of control and they believe that their decisions impact their life and they have control of their lives and they can make decisions to affect their lives, then they might prefer a more participatory leadership style, which makes sense. However, if they are a person with an external locus of control and they believe that what happens to them depends on fate or the winds of chance or you know, something, somebody just does things that affect their lives, then they might prefer a more direct leadership style because that parallels their whole paradigm of life, that things are happening to them. and You just have to adapt. But in general, as perceptions of a person's own abilities increase, there's an inverse correlation. The need for directive leadership often well, tends to decrease. And so if you have people who are developing as leaders, are really confident in themselves and their judgment and their ability to get things done. Sometimes more directive leadership styles can be stifling. Sometimes they can be uh, not well received. And so increased perceptions of your own abilities correlates with decreased need for directive leadership. And of course, this is in general, no one rule is absolute. Now we talked about situation and subordinate characteristics. Which, again, if there's a lot of ambiguity, if there's a lot of risk, um, those are things that will affect your decision. Those are things that will affect which leadership style is the most appropriate. Sometimes you may have perfectly capable people, but if the result of the decision is going to have enormous legal consequences, it's not fair to put them in a situation where they have to just come up with the answer. It could be that that's the time as a leader, you step up, you call the shot, and you take the responsibility. And this is a quote from a uh, former state specialist who's now retired, Ben Gallup. I, I wrote it down when he said it, and I just love it because I think it's so true. He said, if you want autonomy, you've got to be able to wade in ambiguity. There are a lot of times in our careers where ambiguity is a fact of life, and some people get very freaked out by that. Some people feel comfortable in it and are willing to push forward, but the more you're willing to deal with ambiguity and step out as a leader, the more autonomy you're likely to have. And that just comes with the job sometimes, and other times it's something you create. Now we've talked about a little bit about leadership theory. Um, the style approach is kind of the Forrest Gump of the leadership studies. Um, it basically says leadership is what you do. Leaders are as a leader does. And it focuses on the behavior of the leader what they do, and how they act. And I love the style approach. It just helps me explain so many things as I observe and learn about leadership. But it maintains that leadership is composed of two kinds of, comprised of two kinds of tasks, well, two kinds of behaviors, task behaviors and relationship behaviors. Task behaviors are those that accomplish the goals and objectives. And then relationship behaviors are helping people feel comfortable with themselves, comfortable with others, and comfortable with the situation at hand. This leadership grid came about, and it really helps to explain. It first appeared in the 1960s. It's been revised many, many times. But it's designed to explain how leaders guide their organizations in accomplishing their missions through two things. One is concern for people. The other is concerned for what those people accomplish. <coughs> Excuse me. If you look on the left axis there, relationship focused, on the bottom, task focused, the x axis, task focused, goes one to nine, nine being the highest, and the y axis, one to nine, the same, nine being the highest. So, in case this is not showing up on your screen, there's one, one the little circle at the bottom left, and they call that impoverished management. This is, again, geared towards a corporate setting. But that's where you do what you got to do. You just go in, you clock in, you get through the day, you go home. 
contrast that with 1, 9 at the top left, and this is a different situation entirely. It's called country club management, where people are uh, really more important than the results. Good relationships are what's important, an atmosphere that's comfortable and friendly, and a reasonable work tempo. Going all the way to the bottom and over to the far right, you see authority compliance management, and this is where results are a lot more important than the people. Say the drama for your mama, this is about efficiency. And you want efficient operation, and you want to minimize those human distractions as much as possible. And then finally, top right, 9-9, nine, nine, team management. And that's where work is accomplished from committed people. There's a lot of interdependence through a common stake and organization purpose. And you have relationships of trust and relationships of respect. So it's a very different environment to work in than maybe that 1-1. One, one. And of course, 5-5 five, five is the middle of the road. So even though there's a sense of judgment maybe in these labels, um, you might think of in different situations, it might be the most appropriate uh, one to go with. For example, if you're working at McDonald's and there's people lined up out the door and there's uh, lines at the drive through people honking, you don't need necessarily uh, a lot of uh, touchy-feely, how do you feel, making sure everybody's happy with their job style leadership. You really need to get the job done. You need them to do what they need to do to get things going. On the other hand, if you're working with Clover Kids in our profession, um, it's, I'm looking at 1-9 right now. It's not really important what they accomplished, what's important is the process. And what's important is the way they're feeling about it, the way they're engaged, and the way they're working. I would actually go so far as to say that in 4-H and in extension in general, there's probably not a time with our clientele where relationships are not important. Now, maybe over time, uh, and maybe over a person's lifespan, um, it's more appropriate to focus more on the task and what you're accomplishing and what you're producing uh, and the goals that you're meeting, but relationships in our business are always important. It's kind of the heart of what we do. And if you think about it, you know, think about the words of 4-H, caring adult, belonging, generosity, loyalty, larger service. It makes sense. Now, there's some other approaches to leadership. Contingency theory, we're just going to quickly touch on, and this is something that emphasizes the match between the leader's style and the situation at hand, and this is kind of instinctual for many people. A good example, we saw uh, Harry's picture earlier. I'm from Independence, Missouri, so I can call him Harry, but according to the Harvard Business Review, uh, they say, and I quote, an effective executive does not need to be a leader in the sense that the term is now most commonly used. Harry Truman did not have one ounce of charisma, for example, yet he was among the most chief, most effective chief executives in U.S. history. Another approach to leadership is situational leadership theory, and that emphasizes that a leader must adapt to the developmental level of those they lead. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, situational leadership theory uh, outlines four basic styles of leadership. Directing, coaching, supporting, and delegating. And think about the youth teams that you've developed or are working with now, or even like extension councils. If you're directing, that may be when the group has little experience and there's a need to orient and get them working together and establish norms and acculturate new members and set expectations. But as they move on and they gain experience over time, then you might get feelings of identity and ownership beginning to take hold and people start showing some individual initiative. And at that point, you're moving towards coaching and the group is forming. And the group is performing well and eventually you become a supporter rather than a coach. They're acting responsibly. They're starting to make real decisions with real consequences. And if with a youth group, you're helping the voice of youth to be heard, they're adapting uh, their experiences and their understandings to affect solutions and create change and uh, act. And so it's really, really important to be supporting those groups and not trying to lead them in a directing way. Uh, you need to be able to let them step up and be the leaders. If you're a director all the time, you're never going to develop leaders. Now, in our business, often this is where it stops because 
uh, we have a clientele that ages out and matures and they're replaced with younger members who don't have the same experience and we tend to go back to the directing role or if the group has a pretty good staggered age range maybe we just go back to the coaching role and uh, other older youth mentors take the spots of different responsibilities uh, but in some groups you can move to delegating and this may be more with extension councils where the group's performing so well that you as the leader can shift your concern to outside issues that you need to address and you're not needing to spend quite so much time uh, working with them and supporting coaching or directing roles. So situational leadership theory, let's look at these four leadership approaches and then let's look at that style of approach, uh, leadership grid, and cross, cross the two a little bit. If we're directing, this might be a high task requirement for you low on relationship because the people are brand new and as you go on we're talking higher task and higher relationship with coaching supporting you might have low task because they're doing a lot of the work and still maintain those high relationships and delegating if you're not as engaged then of course it's low task and low relationship so things to consider leadership wise people who are great leaders in one situation may not be great leaders in another situation and I've read all sorts of great examples, but just imagine any historical leader who's known for being outstanding and put them in a different point in time, a different place in history. They may never have become a leader. They may have not been a very effective leader if their skills didn't match the situation at hand. No leadership style is going to be successful in every situation. And success as a leader is impacted by the fit with the potential and the fit with the situation uh, I should say the fit with the situation and the fit with the potential followers. Uh, if you have a good fit there and your skills and your abilities and your characteristics and your traits are a good match for those things, then you become a very successful leader. Who do we have to work with? Generation Z, people born in the mid-90s to the current time. And these people tend to be world changers. They're determined to make a difference, make an impact compared to other generations. Uh, they are really big on entrepreneurship. Their biggest dream in many cases is to own their own business. They're also very active volunteers. We talk about the millennials a lot. 60% of Generation Z are active volunteers compared to only 39% of millennials. They tend to be very curious and smart and connected to the outside world, often through technology. Uh, they're more self-directed. They're more dependent on technology, but they're also less dependent on people. And of course, that lends itself to a wide range of stereotypes. Uh, but they tend to be more mature and more self-confident in general. They do expect to work for their success. They value quality over brand loyalty. So if you think about some of these characteristics of Generation Z, and there are a great many more, uh, we do have great, great resources to work with in our youth. So it's important that we engage them as resources uh, and not as just people that we need to lead. So how does 4-H fit into all this? Well, if you look at traits of a leader, one was intelligence, you remember. We in 4-H contribute opportunities for wide experience. Self-confidence is a trait of a leader. 4-H offers guided success, thanks to our adult volunteers and older youth. Traits of a leader, determination. 4-H offers competition, opportunities to fail in a safe environment. Integrity. We're very much a character-based organization. Sociability, we are a very social environment, especially in state events. So do levels of leadership matter? Does it matter if you are uh, involved in a leadership role in 4-H that's maybe at a higher level and the, one I, the people immediately go to a state 4-H council? It could be community youth liaisons. It could be helping with the extension council, working in your county extension office. Do levels matter? And there's a very clear answer according to the research. We don't know. Because the fact is there's just a body of research in 4-H taking shape, but there's a large gap in the literature about whether youth who experience 4-H leadership at higher levels have different impacts, have different results. There is some existing leadership on research on 4-H leadership, uh, and it's focused on state 4-H councils. I've not found any uh, journal articles that involve uh, extension councils or county 4-H councils, 
But the ones on State 4-H councils, there's actually a total of five. And here they are. There's our three dissertations out there. There they are. And the number of journal articles and dissertations that did not originate in the state of Texas, one. So Texas has really been on it. They've really been doing a, a great job of kicking this research effort off. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to contribute from that in Missouri to that in Missouri. But right now, there's not a lot out there. Very little information. And it makes sense because taking the state council example, um, there's maybe one or two people in every state who coordinate a state for each council. The chances that any of them are researchers are pretty low. And the people who are on faculty teams who are researchers may be you know, just preferring to do research in other areas where there's a much broader base of support and there's a lot of exciting development happening. State by state, every state is so different, just like every county is different. Um, and Bruce Boyd and Dooley had a quote from one of the youth that they interviewed for their research. Uh, and the person said, as a state council member, I wish they would have let us lead the state instead of calling us leaders. And the only thing we did was decide on themes. We never got to build our own schedules or make our own choices. I think that they believe that kids, if given the opportunity to leave, will screw things up. And so they don't ever let us do anything. They do everything for us. They make all of our decisions for us. It's a level of frustration there. Now, I think if we did the uh, Missouri 4-H Council that way, you guys would run me out of town because there's a lot of program ownership and meaningful roles. These are people who not only help plan teen conference, it's their vision. And they're the ones that not only plan it, but they implement it. They lead the workshops, and then they help evaluate it when it's all over. And then they help with state congress, and they help assist with a variety of other state events. And we ask them for input on policy issues, their statewide policy issues. And uh, it's, it's a much different role than what we just saw described back in 2004 in another state. In Missouri, I think most would say that the State 4-H Council experience is very interactive, it's very engaging and they're valued as partners and contributors in all aspects. So I think Missouri 4-H does have a lot to contribute to the literature. Now, I, unfortunately, we haven't done this just yet because I have not been in that position just yet. I'm working on finishing up this doctorate of mine, but I did do a class assignment. And so for this class assignment, I grabbed some alumni uh, from five different state 4-H council years and I had them select their own pseudonyms. I want to say that because just in case this little chart up there is coming through, I want to assure you there is no State 4-H Council alumni named Captain Underpants, Cinderella, or Kelskunk. This is a proposal sampling technique uh, via Facebook, and we used a Qualtrics uh, tool to uh, put them through some survey questions. Some were open-ended, some were uh, multiple choice. And we used uh, a variety of procedures for identifying the categories of their answers. And then from those categories that we saw, well, we meaning me, uh, making connections between the categories. So I can't call them findings because this was not scientific. It was not a uh, representative sample. This was strictly for a class assignment. But the ones that we talked to, this would qualify as qualitative data, uh, rated State 4-H Council experience very, very highly and developing leadership skills and other life skills. They rate if there were higher ratings from those who were still in contact with more people. So if they're still in contact with 20 members of their 4-H council family, uh, they tended to rate the experience higher than those who were in contact with fewer members of their state 4-H council group from back in the day. And they tended to have high self ratings when we asked them about uh, op their optimism for the future. They rated their optimism very highly. So according to the groups that participated in this little assignment for me, uh, the top four council skills they acquired, the highest rating was developing social relationship skills. Go figure, there's that social relationship uh, people skills again. Second highest rating, strategic planning skills. And that makes sense because they've had experience with team conference facilitation and planning and operation. Third highest rating was in leadership development. And fourth highest rating was in communication skills. So rather than me tell you what these things are, 
Um, I have some quotes that they shared, and they've given me permission to share these. One person said, when you're chosen to be on State 4-H Council, you're the cream of the crop, and when you have around 30 others who are also in the same boat as you, you find that you have many, many leaders. Some are more dominant than others, are more submissive to others, and find themselves following instead. It can lead to arguments and discussions that go on for hours and hours. We all have the interest of 4-H in mind, but many different ideas and opinions being processed and debated on. Another quote. I had more in common with my fellow council members than with my high school friends. Another one said, I am able to formalize an opinion and get the facts to back me up. I analyze things differently since being on council and find that I tend to agree with others much older than me instead of others my age. Another person said, it made me hold myself to higher standards and often make tough choices as to who my friends were going to be. As I got older, I had to stand up for myself and tell my friends that what they were doing was not acceptable to me that if they didn't change their activities and habits, I would have to part ways. This kind of self-regulation is something I'm really, really interested in studying. Do youth at higher levels of responsibility um, develop stronger skills and the ability to regulate themselves and their own behavior? I don't know. Now there's, oh, I'm sorry, there's one more quote. Today I find myself leading group projects and stepping up to the plate to manage events. I often slide into the leader role without even noticing, and others often volunteer me to be the leader of the group. Being on state council has given me the appropriate balance of confidence, preparedness, and energy to be a leader of a variety of groups. So there's obviously a lot of other types of youth involvement besides state 4-H council. Um, that you can involve youth in planning and uh, implementing and operating one of your county events or involvement is community youth liaisons and they may have that role as part of that job. Uh, county extension councils, county 4-H councils, advisory groups, public relations opportunities, mission teams, there's just so many opportunities that you provide and so many opportunities that 4-H can offer as people develop into leaders. So I'd like to recommend a couple of reading sources. Um, the one on the left is particularly good. These, when we study research, as you know, you tell people don't go to books, go to journal articles, because that's what is going to be current, and that's what's going to be uh, cutting edge. By the time something hits a book, it's usually several years past, and there may be a lot fresher information out there. However, these books are fairly current, but the reason I like them is that they help us frame a very large body of leadership research into categories that you can um, give context to the information with. Uh, as you explore further, it kind of introduces you to different schools of thought, and you can kind of see how what you're reading fits into one of these paradigms, one of these approaches, and it makes it help you, uh, it gives us a lot more opportunity to make sense of it all. Uh, it also talks, the book on the left there, Leadership by Peter Nordhaus, talks about other theories like leader member exchange theory and servant leadership and authentic leadership and transformational leadership. There's a lot more that we haven't touched on. Uh, so I would definitely encourage you to check this out. They're not cheap, but they're definitely worthwhile. The one on the right is more about teamwork and teams and it involves some leadership research and there's a lot of overlap between these two books, but it has a different approach. It has a team-based approach. And you'll see a lot of this information that we've covered in this book by Daniel Levi. So I do encourage that and uh, suggest that if you're interested in going further. I also just suggest going on to Google Scholar, typing in leadership and seeing what comes up and just reading some of the more current research out there. So where we've been in this time we've been together, structuring our existing leadership knowledge, hopefully deconstructing some of our misconceptions about what leadership is, framing the research that's out there on leadership, and orienting our leadership engagement strategies so we kind of have a sense of where we fit into all of this. Where's our place in the world of leadership research and our understandings? So does altitude breed aptitude? What do you think?
appreciate you being with me. I hope this has been helpful. If you have any questions, I'm very glad to be a resource for you at any time at AndersonB at Missouri.edu. And have a great rest of your day. Take care.